All right. Well, hello. We hope you're watching this when you have a few minutes. We. we... Hey, Jenny. Hi, Jenny. Hi, ladies. <laughs> How are you? Good. How are you? Good. good. It's good, good to see you. It's good to see you as well. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. I'm excited. Good. <laughs> Well, we are going to um, just go ahead and get started, and then we'll also send the video out in case any teachers join us. But welcome to Letters Unit 2 Worksheet Walkthrough Woohoo! with Woo Lex and Lee, the letters team. <laughs> go team! <laughs> okay, let me figure out how to move my slide really quick. All right, there we go. I uh, hit record so I can keep going. Ignore norms. I think you everybody has muted their microphone, so thank you. If you have a question, feel free to just um, jump in with just so few of us. We want to make sure to answer your questions, or you can drop it in the chat, but go ahead and just jump in. I think it would be the easiest way to answer everyone's questions. Everything we do comes back to our framework, and one of the reasons we're so excited about letters is it will really help us with the standards especially foundational standards and being able to deliver those effectively. Our learning intention. Today we're learning how to successfully complete the Unit 2 worksheets. And we're just going to go over each one and answer some questions and give a few options that might uh, help you out or help you be able to complete them more easily. And you'll know you're successful when you have completed them all and submitted them. And along those lines, we do just want to point out, remember that as you're finishing each unit, you are testifying in the letters platform that you finished your bridge to practice. And the bridge to practice that we're doing for the most part is just the same worksheet, though there will be times and there are a few times we've tried to uh, simplify it versus in alignment with CSD. So if there are things we have in place in the district that are already happening, rather than have you do something on top of that, we've tried to simplify our bridge to practice to just incorporate things that are already going on in the district without teachers doing more work. All right, so we're going to talk about why the bridge to practice is so important and then go through those eight bridge to practice worksheets and answer any questions as we go. So I'll give you a second to read those quotes. This is the big why in the bridge to practice, which is why we have prioritized it and why our school district is willing to pay the $400 for teachers to actually do it. Um, yes, in the platform, it is a requirement and you do have to you know, say that you did the bridge to practice before it lets you go on to take the assessment. And we know that in order for student outcomes to change, the adult behaviors and teaching routines have to change first. And that's why the bridge to practice is very scary. And um, we're asking teachers to really not only learn something new, but do something differently in the bridge to practice. And that is so hard and so scary. And I think honestly, that's why the coaching piece of this is so important because they know that you are safe and that that's when they want to make their, um, not mistakes, but you know, they want to become more aware and better at the new routines and do that in the safety of the privacy with you and their class. Um, the kids won't know it's a mistake. <laughs> so that's that's the beautiful thing. So in this slide, um, this is the first reflection sheet in unit two. And the idea is that they look at the um, that weird shape thing on the left, like a guitar pick. And they it, with with your student one in mind, look at the early phases. Can they do those things? Can they not do those things? At the basic phase, can they do those things? Can they not do those things? 
So if they, if you, you know, are going down the list and it's a, yes, they can do this. Yes, they can do this. Yes, they can do this. Then when they can't do it, that might be the next skill that you want to teach them. So, so it gives you not only an idea where the student is, but where to go next as their instructor. And so you want to go through that process with each of the three students, thinking that through on the right and using the worksheet to record those thoughts and reflections. Questions about that one? And I like candy corn way better, Amy. Thank you. <laughs> And again, sometimes some of these might be activities you are using with your ECRI routine, so you've already done them. They might be some routines that you throw in whole class to see how the students respond, and focusing on how your case study students are responding, or they could be done small group as well. All right, session two worksheet is very similar. This one's asking, uh, that you actually try them if you haven't already. And so in conjunction with unit one, you might do unit two. I think this is a really good example of kind of looking ahead. And if I'm working with the kids doing two things at once uh, because they work together really well, because this incorporates the same, uh, it incorporates the same skills from one, but adds a few more. So this might be a good example of looking at the two together. And again, depending on your grade level, if you're a kinder and one teacher, you might not have kids getting to advanced phonemic awareness. So in that box, you might say, none of my kids are at this level yet, uh, but then be specific with where they are in the early and basic stages. Mm -hmm. And then in the upper grades, if you have low kids, you might need to start at the early awareness level because that's where your kids might have their holes. So. This is another good example of um, killing two birds with one stone. And if you have kids in the same skill group, it'd be nice to maybe try some of these activities there. And they're fun and they're quick. <laughs> and some of them are part of the equity routine, so. All right, so in session three, there is a phonological working memory worksheet um, that is attached in the assignment for them to use to think about what is phonological working memory and how does it affect learning to read, basically. So it seems like things like listening, following directions, pronouncing words incorrectly when they're repeating a sentence, they, they don't directly necessarily always align in your mind with learning to read. However, if they have weaknesses in those areas, those are phonological awareness gaps that need to be strengthened with practice and with student with routines that those students develop those pathways in their brains to strengthen that phonological working memory so that they um, are able to do those things. And they, they have to be able to think about dictation when you are dictating either spelling words or an entire sentence, the student has to be able to hold on to the whole sentence long enough in their head to know if they wrote the sentence or not, or if they repeated the sentence properly just verbally. So it's a very critical part in that four-part processor that enables the students to complete activities for reading and spelling, and later it'll be writing longer pieces. Do you have any questions so far? What about those two, last two? Okay. All right. In session four, we're still thinking about phonemes, but now we're working on uh, taking it to the phonics level. So now that we've worked on the phonemic awareness in the first couple of sessions. Session four moves to their spelling and do we see errors that are happening in their spelling because of their phonemic gaps, their phonemic awareness gaps. So that's what this uh, session talks about and asks you to reflect on. And for this, any writing that the student already does would suffice. 
Teachers can use their regular spelling tests if they want. They could use their uh, weekly writing from the Reading Street Writing, anything where they could see an error pattern and start to just look for, are there any patterns that would relate to the student's lack of uh, phonemic awareness about that or even their pronunciation? So in this session is where they really get into some of the, the way we make the sounds. And so this one was really interesting and how if kids don't understand how we're forming the sounds, then that translates into their spelling problems. And so any writing sample would work for this. And this one's really interesting then though, because you can start to think about changing instruction, at least for that student, into how they're forming the sounds. And this one was really interesting. Uh, any questions about this one? Awesome. Okay, so moving from the um, the the consonants into the vowels, this um, session five really um, focuses more on the specific vowel sounds and spelling of vowels because those tend to be the harder ones. There's only five letters that are considered vowels, but there's like. 15 variations, and then you have diphthongs and uh, all kinds of weird schwa. things. Yeah, schwa. <laughs> I mean, all, all things can happen. And so, so vowels are very problematic for kids. And I think this worksheet is intended to really get you thinking about um, what errors are the students making? What are they, what are they um, either substituting for that sound that it they're doing consistently incorrectly and also it's it's getting them a lot of times i think we notice things like kids that have an accent and that's that's coming up still but this is a prerequisite to that dialect spelling problem because kids in like boston or um i was telling leslie <laughs> earlier today we had a little girl from Louisiana that lived across. Um, it was when we lived in our apartment. We, we were newlyweds about a thousand years ago. <laughs> and um, the little girl had not only a speech impediment, but she also was from Louisiana. And one one day she she said to me as I was getting home from working at the bank, she goes, we go going to the tour? And it didn't make any sense to me at all. And I had to really think about what she was asking me. So the, the idea that she wasn't hearing the vowels correctly or the consonants, it really kind of alarmed me because I thought, how is this child going to spell anything? Because she's not hearing them and the vocabulary isn't clicking. So, so this worksheet really gets them thinking more specifically about vowels, vowel sounds, vowel mishearings, that kind of thing. Um, and I think it's important to keep in mind that we are not asking for a novel in response to each one of these prompts. Um, what, what we are suggesting is that the teacher thinks about this and gives us like a two or three sentence summary of their thinking in response to the prompt. So we don't need to know every thought that they have in response to this. To complete the assignment and get full credit, we just need to know that they were really thoughtful in in um, with that with that student in their mind. Questions? Um, Go ahead. Okay. I I just wanted to share this today. So I was in a second grade IPLC, and we were looking at writing the whiz buzz. Um, but my teachers were at session five and we're looking at a student have spelled that as T-H-O-T, -T, but the ah uh, and the ah uh sound. And we were really talking through that and like how powerful it is for the student to actually like look in the mirror, have it modeled correctly for them, but then actually see it. And like it was a beautiful alignment of 95 percent <laughs> and all of the letters but in application like it was so cool how we were thinking of what we could do to help the student 
Um, we had an action plan, which was super exciting. So that's what I wanted to share. That's so, awesome. Yay. Thanks for sharing, Jenny. I love that. And that's exactly what this is all about for us is seeing it in action and in, in, in the moment, because that's what's going to help those kids. And just a suggestion, like the Dwizbas is a perfect place to look for these writing samples because there's a lot of writing on the page and you don't have to ask the kids for more. But there are some more resources in the back of the book. There are some spelling lists. So if teachers are, are really thinking that they don't have a writing sample that includes a, a wide variety of words, there are some spelling lists in the back of the manual. There you go. <laughs> That would help teachers be able to answer these questions. But again, we don't want them to have to give something else when they already have all those samples to look at. And if they're grading Dwizbas, that's a perfect chance to just say, hey, I noticed a spelling error with <laughs> yeah. something they're already doing. That's a great example. All right, bridge to practice six. And again, this is likely uh, previewed, kind of similar to what they did in the last two sessions, but focusing on whether it's a dialect or a language difference or allophonic variations, just the way that it's pronounced um, a little bit differently because we're smushing the words together or what the way they're used to hearing it. So the on the left is the spelling errors worksheet that they could use, but again, they don't need to. It's just an extra resource there. But what we just want to know is, did you take a, a couple of minutes to think if there are any dialect variations? And depending on your kids, you know, at some of our schools, all of your kids might be ELs. And so the answer would be yes. And here are a couple of examples. If that's your, if that's the case, like you probably can't make an exhaustive list for some of those kiddos, but you might pick up on the, the biggest problems, you know, that they don't recognize some of the other vowel sounds would be a big problem for some of our Spanish ELs who speak um, that Spanish English. So again, it might be not applicable applicable because my kid doesn't have a dialect or I don't hear any allophonic variations when they're talking. Or it might be, I'm going to give you like three examples because this kid has a whole lot of <laughs> examples. Yeah. It's just more thinking about what are those errors and patterns and then what can you do to address them? Anything to add? Um, somebody did, if you have a teacher who wants to just submit that spelling error worksheet, um, I, I think that is a very acceptable, mm -hmm. she, she had them, she recorded what they, the misspelling was, what the target word was, and then she, she filled out why did it happen and what can I do? And it was, I think that was even more revealing as an assignment than the actual worksheet that was the submission. So I, I mean, I could tell definitely that she had thought about each one of those things in response to each student that she in her case study. Um, and it was it was very well done. So I can't remember who it was. I'm really sorry if it was yours and you're watching. Um, but, but again, that's a good example of how like we're wanting to see your thought and if your thoughts on the spelling errors worksheet and that's what you submit, we're going to be over the moon. Yeah, as well. <laughs> yes, indeed. And the other thing about that, like I was I was reviewing because we took our big assessment today and mm -hmm. I said to Leslie, I said, can you imagine learning to spell in Boston? OK, class, the word is ka. <laughs> the word is ka. I put my ka in the garage. Go. <laughs> I mean, what what is that? So, yeah, I'm going to park my ka. Anyway. <laughs> Oh, is this mine? Yep. Okay. So use the phonological awareness activities with your students. Reflect on their mastery observed in the activity. So the idea is do something. Try it. Take a risk. Do it in private. You can video yourself if you want. They could ask you to come in and model it for them first or co-teach it with them first if, you know, with their coach. They, could, they may ask their coach for help planning. Like, what do I do? And there's there's a whole list of, of exercises they can choose from in the unit. Um, and I just, I think, I think the, the big, huge message is just try, 
just try, see what happens. It might be a disaster. And the biggest takeaway might be, I, that was terrible. And then you go, you know, maybe they'll come to the coach and say, I, I, like I tried this and it was a disaster and, you know, think it through together ways to improve it or do it differently. Or, or they may come to you and say, I did this with my small group and it was just the best thing that's ever happened. And finally there was a light bulb above Joey's head for the first time all year. So I think the big bottom line is, is yeah, it's scary. Yeah, it is. And doing something new is always scary. And getting back to that quote at the beginning, you know, unless you try something different, you're not going to improve. Go for it. <laughs> Bottom line. <laughs> and there are lots of suggested ones in the unit, but that's not necessarily an exhaustive list. So um, the idea is really just to focus on the phonological awareness and you might know ways that aren't listed in the manual or teachers might have heard of ways that aren't listed in the manual. It'd be great to hear about some of those as well. We're going to give some prizes that uh, yeah, we're super excited. We're, we got, instead of just the regular Canyons prizes, we've got some letter specific uh, prizes to go out, but some of them aren't necessarily listed in the manual, but help with manipulating sound in other ways. So it could be any, anything they want to try that is some way that they're working with phonological awareness. So, and something else that just occurred to me when when you were saying that um, is that on the bookshelf where the curriculum maps are, there is also the skill based small group manual, and that that is a a gem and a jewel. And it was written based on these routines and this information in letters. So if if teachers are looking for something, a, a, a lesson plan, a way to implement a thing to do, there are those. And there are also PA routines. If you remember way back in history in Canyon School District, um, with the Reading Street kit came the RTI kit. And in there was that PA phonological awareness book. And so there's a ton of routines written there that they could use as well. So there, there are resources within letters, but also within Reading Street and on that digital bookshelf for them to tap into. Awesome. Questions? We're looking forward on the days, on our in-person days to having people share out, are there any activities you've tried that aren't in the book or how's it going? So hopefully that will be fun for us. All right, the last one, unit two, session eight, uh, looks at assessment, analyzes assessment. And the two things we're asking them to do is how do the results of the assessments we already give inform planning? And that can be any and all of the assessments from uh, the Dwiz Buzz to a Cadence or Keep or whatever. And then it asks to administer a screener. We put in their Passy just because most, I think all but maybe one of our schools is doing 95% group. So most of our low kiddos would probably be taking the Passy anyway. But that is not the, and it says Passy, but there is also some flexibility there. Like if you're a low kinder, your kids might not even be up to this level yet. So you might use the screener in the RTI kit. Um, same for your upper grades, or they might look to the past, which is also in the manuals book. So really the point of this one is just to give some kind of PA screener. And if your kiddos already take it, just have the teachers look at that data. If you're at a school where the interventionists give it, Maybe just share it with the teacher so the teachers can look at it and start to know what the data looks like or have the teachers uh, give it for those few kiddos. And again, depending on the grade, they might not get all the way up, right? They might not be able to do the harder skills. So I would stop when I know like, hey, the kid can only get this far. That tells me where I should start instruction. I don't need to keep assessing when I know they can't do it. So for any of your grades that do that, it's more that they're looking at an assessment to be able to inform their next step. And in case you haven't perused your manual, 
Uh, this <laughs> is in, there's a section in the back that's additional resources and the past and there's that's where the word list was for the spelling and there's there's a whole bunch of stuff back there that's pretty cool so it's um you know just in your spare time take a gander <laughs> <laughs> but really too again going back to don't do anything extra because we are pretty comprehensive in canyons so if your school's already done the passy just see if the teachers can get that data see if you can get that data so the kids don't have to take it, retake a test they've already taken. If you're in a different program, there's probably a placement for that program. Like Saxon has a placement test. So just look at that. And too often though, the teachers don't see that or teachers, the uh, interventionists, it lives with the interventionists. So if you're a teacher who um, is in a school that uses either of those programs, just ask if you can have the placement data uh, because your kids have probably already taken this. We don't want to double up the work on teachers or students, but there would, there may be a few cases where uh, the kiddo is not low enough that they're in it, uh, or they have too many kids we need in intervention. So not all of them can be an in inter intervention. So they didn't all get the passy. So uh, uh, there may be instances where a teacher needs to give it to one of the kids. And so again, just go as far as the kids skills hold and then you'll know where to start instruction and again it doesn't have to be the passy that's just the one we know most schools use any questions about that good maybe found it be 14. <laughs> anything else all right i i can't think of anything i think um we've just been so consistently impressed by the work that's been turned in in canvas and the the observations that we've been going out and doing have been just absolutely so just amazingly grand and i um the teaching in this school district is is really top notch and we have the best teachers ever in the world and um so i just if there's anything that you anybody ever needs please don't hesitate to reach out to Leslie and myself because we absolutely want every single teacher to be successful in going through this learning and every single student to be the beneficiary of the teachers getting more comfortable with this content and, and having the learning as their background knowledge. Yeah, and thanks for the uh, comments, Amy and Jennifer. We really know that the teachers are going to need to choose what works in their class. And so the, and that's them making the choice is also showing us, though, that they're implementing, that they're thinking about it, that they're bringing it to their kids. So if they make a choice that doesn't come from the manual but works or if they have a different program or a different assessment that they're used to giving that will give them the data, then they're doing what we want them to do. They're getting it to the kids. And we might learn new ways to do it as well. Thank you for joining us today. It was really fun to see you all. And I hope you got something out of it. And um, Camille will put this in the Canyons U bite size um, place where it lives. <laughs> and, uh, in, you know, there. campus course. Yeah. In the there. campus course. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we will see all of you probably soon. Thank you. Have a good night.